This is GamesAtWork.biz, your weekly podcast about gaming, technology, and play. Your hosts are Michael Martin, Andy Piper, and Michael Rowe. The thoughts and opinions on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests alone and are not the opinions of any organization which they have been, are, or may be affiliated with. This is episode 483, Future Frames. Hello everybody, welcome again to another episode of GamesAtWork.biz, your weekly technology podcast. My name is Andy Piper. I am back from a few weeks away from this podcasting mic and excited to be here back with my friends Michael Mm -hmm. and Michael. Mr. Michael Rowe, how are you? I am doing just peachy well. Uh, We've uh, had a nice little river in the backyard, which was kind of fun, but uh, now that that's over, I get to talk tech with my friends. So Michael, how are you? Fantastic, and really excited about this week's episode and the fact that we're all back together again, too, and there's so much to cover. In fact, this very first article I'm betting is going to have a number of different things to unpack. So let's get right to it, shall we? The Verge um, has always some intriguing things, and this week we have the Meta's Big Tease is the name of the article, and it's really talking about the Orion AR glasses, and we've... (laughs) kind of thought about this sort of thing for a really, really, really long time in a variety of ways. So it's intriguing to see an example of them really being here. The the Clark Kent style glasses, as they're described, you know, big, big thick uh, frames around them, lots of cameras, uh, kind of uh, helping to imagine that AR experience. And Andy, we probably should start with you because you're the one who's been closest yes. to something like this given your experiences with those Ray-Ban frames, what, what was you're your you're wearing take? right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. So let's talk about this. So this is um, Meta's Connect event they do. Uh, it's kind of their WWDC sort of event. It's their annual-ish, I believe, uh, developer and, you know, what's coming next uh, event. And they focused this time on um, their AR ambitions and as well as announcing the Quest 3S uh, AR headset, they also showed off this thing called which Quest 3S is coming out. It's available. You can order it. Uh, the Orion glasses are more of a demo. And then they let, invited a bunch of journalists in to try them out. And having demoed them on stage, they had some people come and play with them and show, showed them off. So I've got a few thoughts here. So one thing I want to call out, stepping, taking a step back from Orion to what they currently have is the Quest 3S, which is another mm-hmm. version of the Quest headset in the, in the sort of existing line. But one of the stories I was looking at today, and it's not actually in our list of links that we were going to talk no, about. No, I was looking for it. But uh, they are going to be enabling essentially similar to what Apple's done with the iPad OS apps. Um, on on the headset on the uh, Apple Vision Pro headset, where you can have these two dimensional windows uh, running apps in the, in the uh, in the Meta Quest environment, and they've also, of course, uh, said that other folks, other uh, technology companies, will be able to produce their own Quest compatible headsets. Although I don't think I've seen any of them yet come out. I think there's been some hints of what they may be. So I was reading a story that was headlined: "You're about to see a bunch of phone apps." Show up on uh, on the Quest because the Quest is essentially running a version of Android, right? With with a bunch of other stuff going on. Um, so they're obviously taking a cue from Apple and and the direction they've gone in there. But the other thing is that with the Orion stuff, they're also taking a cue from Apple. So I'm wearing. You're quite right to point out. I'm wearing the Meta Ray Ban glasses as we record this. Um, I wear them most of the time when I can when they're charged. Um, they're quite fun. They're quite nice. I occasionally touch my fingers to the arm and ask the AR, uh, AI, I bet you beg, beg your pardon, the AI companion a question about something um, or use them to take a picture or a video, which is super convenient. Uh, when we were on vacation recently, I took a lot, bunch of photos with the glasses because I didn't want, need to pick out, take out my, cam- my, my, uh, my phone. Obviously, it's an entirely different type of cam- uh, camera and, and picture, but they're very good. The Orion ones are sort of merging the two ideas, right? So merging the 
the the thick framed although i would argue as this article does in the verge they're not that they're not that obtrusive in terms of a uh, glasses style that we we go backwards and forwards oh, they're buddy holly baby they're buddy yeah, holly yeah i mean we go backwards and forwards in <laughs> style so right i mean some people prefer thicker frames other people prefer lighter ones we've gone from the you know the, the almost not there frames and just a sheet of glass i've worn that style in the past to uh to the thicker ones and i don't think the they're super obtrusive um the weight of these ones the ones i'm wearing is is a bit distracting sometimes when I, especially when i'm switching from my other pair to these ones but it is a noticeable difference but it's not bad um but the point of this story is well they this is a tease because they're not actually releasing them this is a concept right. they 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 have got technology here which enables them to overlay stuff in the lens so that over what you're looking at and label it which is cool but they're far too expensive to manufacture at scale and 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 sell at scale so they just got on saying look this is where we're going and i think that's a really cool and good and useful thing i still have tons of challenges and problems with meta's use of data and that's why i've switched <laughs> off all of the always on listening features in the glasses i wear um and yeah i i just think it's a really interesting next stage and it's kind of a bit of a gauntlet challenge to apple in terms of uh you said that you kind of implied you were going to do smart glasses and then you did this big chunky headset michael you're well, making I, th there are two things that i found really interesting about this one the wristband yeah. The wristband is, to me, much more interesting than the glasses because I don't like chunky glasses. Um, and these aren't real, right? This is, a, as you say, it's a tech demo. It's, it's a proof of concept. By the time this became a product, they would not be this chunky, I don't think. So as much as I hate chunky glasses, I don't care, right? This is a demo. Uh, the wristband, though, is very interesting to me uh, in the sense that the de the 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 hand gestures that they're demoing, Apple Channel solved that completely differently yes. through sensors and video and all this other stuff. And when you think about how companies kind of jump the market on certain things, is when you take a completely different approach. So the wrist sensor, I think, is a really neat idea of a way of of capturing those finger movements for certain key gestures. I thought that was really cool. Um, the separate, it, it almost reminded me of the, um, oh God, I can't even remember what the, was the the PS2 or the PS3 had the little bar, the light bar with the infrared. That that separate device where they put some of the computer po computing power and capabilities in a separate little, uh, almost like a, a remote con TV remote control size device that you could put elsewhere in the space uh, and still get the computing power. Again, another great great way of uh, addressing the the weight and the design problems that traditional headsets do. So I think those are really really good examples of of kind of coming at the problem in a totally different way. And this is exactly what we want to see, right? We want to see Apple and Meta and and Leap or anybody else to kind of force each other to, yeah. to ratchet up the technology, shrink down the footprint of the technology and drive new innovation. So, so as much as I would never use the Meta device for the data privacy issues that you described, I'm really, really excited about this. Well, before I... Let Michael Martin chime in um, with thoughts. Um, I yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Let's, let's let's again take a step back for for listeners who may not have read the article yet, but you should go read the article. Check it out. Um, the Orion, as as Michael Watch just the video. Michael just implied, the Orion concept is this this set of glasses, a bit chunkier than normal, um, and this neural wristband, which he just mentioned, which kind of looks a little bit like a Fitbit. Uh, and uh, also this, uh, what they I think uh, call, have referred to as, as some kind of uh, uh, battery pack or puck. It's not a battery pack. It's uh, uh, but, it, but it needs to it's be compute. Th this compute this compute puck. Uh, but it needs to be that puck is kind of the the brains here, right? So that needs to be within about twelve feet of the glasses. So it's the kind of thing you're probably going to end up wearing on your belt or, or somewhere else if they this was a released product. Um, and yeah. 
And yeah, that's not so different from from what Apple's got, apart from that wristband thing. But again, I think you're right. I think where I was going with the original comment about the Quest 3S and the uh, addition of what they're talking about as spatial apps to the Quest 3S, um, they've also done a ton of, you know, absorbing Apple's metaphors, control metaphors, done differently. Um, Just to round out the description of the hardware, the... Uh, glasses include seven cameras um, to anchor virtual objects in space and assist with the eye and hand tracking, and uh, and they also have these these displays built into the the glasses. Um, Michael, what are you thinking? We've 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 both been talking all about it, and you've been patiently waiting your turn. Yeah, well, I have because uh, I was excited to kind of see where the conversation was going to go. So uh, my reactions are kind of out of two sides of my mouth so on (laughs) on the hardware side part of me was like this is ridiculous right you're now having to wear a wristband you're having to have a puck in your pocket or on your utility belt along with your batarang and everything else and michael's pointing to his watch and saying well but michael you're walking around with an apple watch and you've got an iphone in your pocket and you've got all that stuff anyway and it can do it can Touch gestures and stuff, which right? which kind of brings me to that point too. That says the ubiquity of hardware for compute would suggest that you don't need to be fully in a new ecosystem, and this is not really um, new and different in this way. Um, if you imagine a two by two matrix, and the two by two matrix is I've got the right idea and the wrong idea, and I've got is it new and different or is it you know, a me too kind of thing. The main objective here and what I think I want to see is the innovation happening for it's the right idea and it's new and different. It's solving the problem a different way. So this is solving an interesting AR problem in a way that we've imagined here for a really, really, really long time that just hasn't come to pass yet because the technology stack, the compute power, the wireless communication, the ability to touch the cloud or not, you know, so there's an interesting privacy element around all this here too, that can be brought to bear. This doesn't feel like it is yet in the wow major innovation. And you know, couldn't you have used one of those seven cameras to kind of do the peripheral vision version at the minimum to notice that there is a hand gesture that is appropriate for doing what you needed to do? So uh, I, that that was my high level version. Um, and then moving one step past that to react uh, and take the conversation a little bit further forward is that much of this, and Andy, you alluded to this too, because you're using the meta glasses, the Ray-Bans from a AI perspective and asking questions. This is a new compute paradigm that others have tried to do. We've talked about this plenty of times on the show here recently too, where you can now start to um, muse on thoughts and you can leverage that AI assistant to um, do some research on your behalf or create the list that you might need to do. And that's a different way of augmenting the human experience and leveraging that always on capability uh, and maintain and persist what is being created while you're out and about in the world. So they're desperate to move away from or move past the mobile platforms that have, have kind of tied up their business, like mm-hmm. Apple and Google, um, have, have been in different ways, blockers or competitors. So, and then this article in The Verge literally says, uh, Zuckerberg literally comments on, on this this issue and wanting to move <laughs> past the mobile platforms that Facebook grew up on. Um, interestingly, with the current Meta Ray-Ban collaboration, it does depend on an app. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't completely depend on the app, but um, it's not going to work um, fully. You need the app to get the photos off, obviously. And oh, I say obviously, it's not that is it's not obvious. That is the fact. You you you, you, you sinks uh, into your into your app and then into your camera roll. And with the AR piece, that's only going to work through talking to the phone to to talk to the cloud at the moment. Now this article talks about the Orion demo having not having to to, to to do that and having its own uh, network and other things that could be enabled in the future. So, yeah, I think it is interesting to see if they're able to create an entirely new platform like that. But I, I, I just think it's 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 quite a bold thing to to go and take something 
Uh, they've been evidently working on for six or seven years and, and, and finally show it off, uh, even though they, they know that it's not, you know, they, they decided to cancel it as a, as a product and, and come out with other things and focus on other things. Uh, and I think based on what we're seeing, that's probably been a, a good thing for them. Now, talking about those mobile phones, though, mm-hmm. let's talk about iPhones briefly. Yes, exactly. So um, we've we've had a couple of articles related to this, and we've got some iFixit stories and the like about the iPhone 16 being uh, touted as the most repairable iPhone yet, uh, which is like saying also it's the thinnest iPhone yet, or you know, there's a lot of things along those lines too. It's the most advanced iPhone yet. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> of course, it's the newest. It should be. So it, it, last it's, year's was the most advanced one yet. I, that, that's how well, they are. that was then. <laughs> so the, the these this is great news for those that want to do the repairs themselves and we've talked about the right to repair kinds of concepts on the podcast more than once so this is a welcome piece of news for folks that want to go about it in this way um what, speaking personally that's not really where i'm parked and i'll tell you having tried to do repairs to my printer my coffee machine uh my dryer um it seems like in the past week i've uh, or week and a half i've had to do lots of repairs to lots of things um there's not everything that right. i want to repair myself and i would like help from the right people to go and knock it out michael is chomping the chomping. great thing about this though is uh, you know i know andy hardware hacker michael you like to hack stuff too I don't, but I don't always want to go back to the manufacturer. So the key thing here is an ecosystem of people who can repair it. Uh, It's not about the individual doing the repair. Uh, It's about making it easier for other businesses to be able to also do the repair. And from that angle, uh, I think they've done some interesting stuff. Um, But... It's not, it's not like the, the laptop where you can swap out all the components yourselves, right? So it's still not a easy to repair device. Let's, let's not confuse ourselves. It may be the most repairable in years, but it is not easy to repair. Yeah, I mean, if they don't get rid of that, that, that component pairing stuff that is, is extremely hostile to, to third party repair, then um, it, you're still, yeah, it may be easy to repair, but it's still uh, easier for folks in the Apple store rather than, than anyone else. It is a question. You mentioned hardware hacking. Um, you know, we went on, on, on a camping trip and uh, recently and I just, you know, was fixing. I was, I was glad that I had enough tools with me to fix uh, some lights and, and things like that. And then I've just received a, a new, um, very small resin printer called a Light 3DP version two, and I haven't done any resin resin 3D printing before, but this is open hardware, so um, it's been an interesting challenge because by being open hardware, it's a bit, uh, you know, do it yourself and a bit sort of uh, figure it out yourself uh, as you go. The 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 person who shipped it is not the most supportive or the most active in supporting people he's he's been he's been helpful but it took me a while to get some some uh, yeah but it's, but it's open out. you can just ask others it is. absolutely and that's what's ended up happening okay but I, I, so I, I do have one question sorry to, 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 yeah. to tangent a bit but a resin printer uh, I'd, I'd love to get your experience with it going forward because other people that I knew have resin printers uh, that use you know the the light and resin to to cure it um, it's it's fast it's interesting but the pieces aren't long lasting and they're subject to heat and light decay so I'd like to get your experience as you move forward if they've I solved have, that problem yet I have zero zero experience to this to, to, to this point I've just managed to get it to switch on and the screen to work so uh, <laughs> but for camping uh, we'll purposes it's kind of cool right so you had yep. it portable you had it with you and if you needed to fabricate something in the field it, it you literally had that is portable right? it's in a box it's in a it's probably the case is probably about the same size as probably if you stacked a couple of Apple Vision Pro cases on top of one another. In fact, if you've got an Apple Studio Pro, one of those kind of carry, uh, Apple Studio, uh, Mac Studio, mm-hmm. uh, carry mm-hmm. carry cases, um, you know, if you imagine your Mac Studio, sort of big square thing in a, in, a, in a padded case, that's more or less the same size as this little 3D resin printer. So, cool. um, yeah, it's, it's pretty compact. We'll, we'll come back to it. Yes. <laughs> but not the size of a Mac Classic in a carry case, because that's, no. that's a little bit bigger, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> or 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 the 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 iMac 27 inch carry cases that they made. Oh, I don't think That's I ever saw one of those. That I thought I that, saw those. Is that a box? It, <laughs> it, it it basically was. You know the one one bag that you carry with the 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 crossover strap. Yeah. Imagine that bag, but about 29 inches wide. Yeah, that that would certainly hit you in the back of the knees a lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> that that would be kind of crazy. Um, all right, so so staying on the theme of kind of crazy stuff, uh, we we had a fun app conversation from nine to five Mac um, from the folks over at Halide who were exp- uh, expressing disbelief in the reasons why their their updates to their software in the iOS app store were not well approved. What's what's really interesting about this? So so Apple has you know to talk about this closed ecosystem, uh, they've been getting more and more restrictive about access to sensors on the device and and permission asking and all this other crap. And there's been lots of stories about people complaining how it works on Sequoia and pop-ups, etc. However, Halide uh, is an app that has been showcased this year at WWDC as it relates to the camera <laughs> and their yeah. app got rejected in app review for not having an appropriate message for asking for permissions on the camera and it's the same message that they've had for what seven or eight years well wow. so uh, this is an organiz- an, a, an enterprise organizational issue <laughs> yes <laughs> on yeah. on you know someone down in the bowels of of a checklist didn't read the checklist right <laughs> I have to imagine this is going to be corrected in short order. This is just one of Quickly. those those things. Has it been already? Yeah, yeah. I mean, by the time people are listening to the show here, it's probably corrected, don't you think? We'll have to find it. I know there were some posts on Mastodon where where they, they actually submitted two new versions, one with a Limerick version asking for uh, permission to access your camera, and the other one in a, I believe it was a Shakespeare sonnet uh, for the permissions uh, prompt. And uh, they, they used uh, ChatGPT to generate them and then just pasted them into the per- permission string. Now, now, oh, now, yeah, exactly, Andy. Speaking of the same thing. This is this talking is a, of, another case where it's working and working properly, wouldn't you say, Andy? I think so. There's another app story we've got um, here uh, on the iOS side before we move on um, to, and, and this is uh, MK uh, MK BHD Marquez Brownlee, who is a YouTuber yeah. uh, who I've got a lot of time for. I've enjoyed his product reviews. We've talked about some of them are on the show before, particularly around the Rabbit R One and the um, uh, the other AI thing, hardware, help me out, folks. Humane pin. The humane pin. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, and uh, look, he's he's a he's been he's built a reputation as this, you know, pretty straight down the line gut kind of uh, reviewer, and uh, but but also as an influencer, and he's kind of you know got that that cool aspect, and he released this app this week. Uh, which is a wallpapers app that you have to pay I think fifty dollars a year for or something ridiculous to get access to some wallpapers, most of which are, or many of which are AI generated. And then uh, it had a, it asked for tons of permissions and it has tons of ads. Uh, and within a few hours, he was uh, he'd already been called out and he was responding on Twitter saying, um, on, "Sorry, on that that other other platform, whatever it's called these days." Uh, and saying, look, you know, I've learned, I'm learning, I'll fix it, or we'll, we'll move forward. But he's doubled down on it. Now, I have come across this week multiple GitHub projects that kind of run around his app and either get the download the stuff for free without you having to pay anything or um, just provide all the provide all the wallpapers on in a GitHub repo because they're easy to access. Um Really, I just be—I was just really disappointed. To be honest, just didn't seem like his kind yeah. of a vibe. It's web dot one dot stuff. I mean, when we first saw apps showing up on phones, this is the thing, right? We saw navigation apps app. that were doing, you know, a hundred dollars, um, you know, for a Tom Tom or Garmin navigation app on a phone or things like that, right? Yeah. And I had to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't have to. No one, no one said you got to do it. You could have, you could have bought. No, the I, I wanted device. the 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 hardware device that extended the the GPS on the phone better. Blah blah blah. But but I think I think you know you're. 
your your point, you know, this is the fart app of the future. Um, but current, that I, I think what point, really happened okay. here is <laughs> <laughs> is you know. He paid some third party to write the app. He didn't focus on it. He had them put his name on it. And I'm, I'm purely speculating. There's no proof that this is what happened. But my speculation is, I mean, he's an influencer. Yes, his reviews are good. And, and I've watched them and I've seen them on, on podcasts where he's talking stuff. But he's an influencer. He wanted some additional income. He had someone write an app for him and he didn't pay attention to it. And, and now, now that he's getting called out on it, as you say, you know, he's doubled, doubling down to some degree. And, you know, there are other really good wallpaper apps out there. I think Icon Factory has one called Wallaroo. Uh, I have no need for a subscription to wallpaper apps, right? <laughs> so uh, to, to, to that point, when, when I see this type of app, I, I'm, I'm not surprised by it. Uh, I feel bad for a him and I feel bad for the people who spent their money on it. It, it is a me too app, right? So back to my two yep. by two matrix, it is the, the wrong app and it is a me too version of the wrong app because you're exactly right. If you want wallpaper, go to Unsplash, go to Pexels. You can download yeah. whatever you want and then save it as wallpaper. Boom, boom, boom. You're done. So I, I don't, I don't mind people trying to monetize their, their reputation and for someone who's an influencer and has lots and lots of people like this, why not that to me that uh, I think that is perfectly a okay and fine. Andy, you're, you're finding a ton of what looking like wallpaper here well, as we go, right? He pulled them from the Git repo and he's, he's demonstrating the, yeah. <laughs> I literally the wallpapers for us. Downloaded the, uh, a GitHub. I forked to GitHub repo while we were talking. I claimed to GitHub repo, <laughs> ran it and it downloaded all the wallpapers and there you go. Um, so yeah. Oh man. Probably so so you buying, own 50 bucks. Probably won't be buying that, uh, that app. It's, it's disappointing. As I say, I was curious to see whether, how uh, fast that, that could happen. That, yeah. How, well, also no, so actually, is this, how fast is this he his, fixed, they fixed it. Is this so, his actual repo or did somebody create this? And no, just no, no. Pulled somebody else created the repo. So there's, there's like multiple yeah. repos on GitHub of versions of code that will go pull the wallpapers. Yeah, yep. and you probably could have asked your glasses there, Andy, if uh, it would get you a new wallpaper, and it would have been provided too, right? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about this. That well, Michael, o didn't you... only if it was constantly listening. Didn't Michael? Didn't you find this uh, this next link we've got in the oh, app section? Here? Yes, I, I did. So, um, you know, t time flies is uh, the name of this little app, and you need to just go take a look at it. I came across it somewhere or another in my travels this week, and is a cute uh, representation of what it, looks like little flies flying around. And when you put your mouse over it, it tells you what time it is. It reminds me of Biology 101 uh, as a uh, undergrad, where you have to take your fruit flies oh, yeah. experiments. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's fun stuff, and 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 it just was you know, can you do something clever? Absolutely. And do you need to track people and their location to serve it up? Probably not. So did you check the code before you ran the app? I, I, it's, it I, runs in the browser. It's absolutely great. It's yeah. just a it's just a JavaScript canvas that um, that you know literally um, it's all there in the one in the single page. It's a fun it's a fun app. I love it. It's, again, I I wrote yeah. about this on my blog. A few weeks ago, um, and I may not have talked about it on the show, but I, oh. I did talk about just the the way that the web uh, enables and and humans can, can you know uh, just be so collaborative and be, be so creative, and and it just excites me. I just I just think we need to celebrate the humans at the core of everything much more frequently, and. And be grateful for the technologies we have that enable us to be creative and do fun things. And and it is not a me too thing, you know. At least as I haven't encountered something like it before. So I, I to me that appeals too, and that appeals also yeah. for the distribution notion here because anybody with a browser can go experience this without any kind of additional cost. You don't have to ship it. You don't have to go someplace to get it. It's just there. Well, you got to go to the web. <laughs> Um, so rounding out our I'd, show. I'd like to put that as a watch face on my Apple Watch, but it's a closed ecosystem. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you know a developer who might be able to do something about that. Nope. You can't create watch faces. <laughs> <laughs> so rounding out our show for today, we're 
talking yes. about a CNN article, which I, I know is going to be intriguing for us too, from um, the idea about touchscreen kiosks and around choices and the mechanisms around those choices. And it's a rather in-depth article that does some um, good analysis on what a kiosk does that maybe a human doesn't do. And we're back again, kind of where we started the episode here today on the human interaction, the human element. So can a touchscreen speed things up, right? Can you order quickly from a touchscreen and maybe even more so with more accuracy than you would if you were interacting with a human? And I think we'd all agree the answer is probably yes. Um, but there are some intriguing findings here, such as uh, you could ensure that every interaction with a customer who's coming up to order their Big Mac fries and shake could be prompted to say, and would you like something else with that and require an en engagement from the customer. And more often than not, those suggestions will, uh, maybe not more often than not, but frequently enough, those suggestions will be taken and those orders will increase. And that creates some interesting um, challenges for the folks back in the kitchen and, and for the folks way in line. Upsell. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've seen it well, around tipping. We've seen it around a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So, so this is certainly intriguing. And I know I felt the same. I feel the same way too. If I'm in front of a counter and there's a, a menu of a variety of options, I oftentimes will stop, pause for a moment and, and think, okay, well, what is it that it, I, it, that I want? And there's a, a slowdown there too so uh, lots of ways we could take I, this guys i love this story because it makes us think about the unintended consequences of um these things and i think that's the there's a few yeah. elements here it focuses a lot on mcdonald's but this is uh, these 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 kiosks these self-service screens have appeared in pretty much all of those kinds of stores now um, uh, and in the UK as well, and I'm sure in other parts of the world, I'd be curious to know the cultural differences and locations in which there's been a real pushback against it or, or that they just have not been adopted. But, um, you know, look, the headline here is, well, the assumption was that this kind of technology would threaten jobs. Um, and actually, it's led to quite an interesting pivot and shift in both consumer behavior and employee reassignment and new roles and and growth of staffing the the story here about the battle between minimum wage laws uh, and ceos saying our oh, fine we'll just pivot to technology and get rid of the people um is is interest is, is an interesting element of the narrative because i think that We've got this uh, former McDonald's CEO saying, I told you so in 2016, that if you raise the minimum wage, then we're just going to put in more of these machines um, and, 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 and the unions can't, you know, get a, get a foothold to, to in increase, um, uh, you know, the, um, the, the wages. But actually, uh, you're finding as you just highlighted, Michael, both the consumer behavior leading to maybe more ordering or different products or or uh, or, or whatever, and, and also the fact that the humans are still needed to, to run things in different ways or, or change the way things operate. So I found I wanted to include this in this week's conversation because I think that we've been doing a, story, a, a podcast for 20 years on technology – gaming technology, but technology and the future of work mm -hmm. and how these technologies impact our business. And this is an absolutely key example of users getting familiar with the user interfaces of being able to just walk up, touch a screen, and things happen, big version of a phone. Uh, that stuff being as reliable, reliable, presumably repa repairable, reliable, and cost-effective that, that restaurants and places can put these things in and uh, rely on them um but there's that consumer familiarity and comfort level with that type of technology you can still see a lot of older people interacting with these kind of machines very hesitantly not very comfortably not wanting to necessarily have that in that kind of online uh the online but in person experience um, electronic experience electronic experience um preferring perhaps to go to a, a register go to talk to a real person 
Um, and then uh, this other swathe of people who've grown up more with this technology have become more familiar with it, um, changing the behavior, but then the ways that the businesses have had to adapt their staffing. So, so I had two thoughts actually about this. Um, one was uh, we did a similar story, what, six months ago or so, uh, about self-checkout machines being yes. pulled from stores uh, right where the belief was it was going to cost jobs, but what ended up happening was there was more stuff stolen, uh, and they had can't, to actually have more people yeah. to monitor the people doing right. I mean, so so that's a kind of an interesting dichotomy there. The the other aspect that that I had here, at least this is a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, it, it's probably similar in other countries, but not the same because of the aspect of the living wage um, in the U.S. So many businesses nowadays will do some kind of electronic ordering with a tip. And so, you know, it's 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 almost offensive to the point of, okay, you tip people for good service. You don't tip in advance of the service. And I can just see them adding a tip button on this because, well, we've got more people now cleaning up the McDonald's restaurant, right? And so, again, unintended consequences and how do you address that would be interesting to have a deeper dive on what they're doing and how it's behaving. All right, I'm going to go um, out on an, and third. I, I just want to address that. I want to address that yeah, tip thing. Go. The U.S. needs to get rid of that tipping culture. Yeah. And actually, pay I agree. People. And 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 everybody, lots of people agree that. And and but and we still we don't tip have that because problem. we have to. <laughs> Yeah. Right. We tip because the people aren't being paid a living wage, which only reinforces the problem. It's 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 a catch twenty two. All right. Well, there you go. Yep. Carry on. Please I, give us your third. Absolutely. And and three. I hope I remember my three because it was really good and really important. And I'm going to vamp a little bit while I try to remember it. No, just <laughs> uh, was if if you think about the aspect of. Um, we just got out over the last few years a global pandemic. And people were cleaning stuff because they were afraid of transmission through touch. And now you've got all these touch interfaces in public places where people may or may not be appropriately handling things for healthcare. Maybe they've hired somebody to wipe the screen between people. Yeah, doubtful, <laughs> doubtful. But that that's a variation oh, doubtful, on a yes. theme that, that resonates for me, which is we're unwillingly turning the customer into an employee. Although temporarily, exactly, and to me that is like and not paying them. is the value proposition of that of value to the customer, and in some cases Which. the answer is going to be yes. In other cases, um, and again, I know I'm not my user, and there's different groups of people that might feel different ways about this sort of thing. Um, I generally do not want to become a temporary employee that has to know the interface for this particular company's instance of a cash register system and the like. Andy, Which do you feel the same way? Than the one next door. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not. I'm not sure. I, what I, what I'd love to do, gents, is 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 take us home on that very point. Is because, you know, Michael feels a little uncomfortable with that whole. Uh, business making the customer their employee. We'd love you, as our listeners, to become our employees temporarily. Employ and give us send ideas. us <laughs> send us your links, share the stories you're interested in, uh, so that we can we can talk about them. On our and you show. won't have to touch a screen other than your own. Uh, you won't have to touch. You may have to touch your 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 phone screen to to subscribe or or to tell send messages to your friends <laughs> to tell them all to subscribe to our great podcast. But uh, but yeah. Um, I think it's a really, it's a great story. I think it's a nice story to wrap up on. Um, again, brings us kind of full circle around this, why we started right, talking, doing this podcast, talking about tech and yeah. uh, evolution of business and society. And it's it's really cool. So uh, it's great to be back with you both. Uh, I'm sorry I was away for a, for a few weeks there, but uh, Michael Rowe, where should people come to uh, find out about the show and tell people to go to? I think the most appropriate place is just remember our name and go to gamesatwork.biz on the web. That sounds great. And uh, I will be back next week, and I think both of you will as well. So in the meantime, we will see ya. See ya. Bye. You've been listening to gamesatwork.biz, the podcast about gaming technology and play. We are part of the Blueberry Podcasting Network, and would like to thank the band Random Encounters for their song, Big Blue. 
You can follow us at our website at gamesatwork.biz. 